It's one of the many conspiracy theories surrounding Kate Middleton. So people are saying her hands don't look real. So last week, Kate Middleton was seen for the first time since around Christmas. Mm which is crazy. I don't know what to believe anymore. In this video, we're thoroughly analyzing the ring, the eyes, and the hair. We couldn't see What fight. in the hell is going on with Kate Middleton? This is all a distraction. TikTokers poring over Kate Middleton videos to determine whether they're real or fake. The constant trend turnover rate making you feel like you need to stay glued to social media to be in the know. Kylie Jenner's latest out of touch social media post. Fake news peddlers writing the most sensationalist headlines to get you to click. Held trusted news organizations writing the most sensationalist headlines to get you to click. Knowing that more eyeballs means more ad revenue. This is all a late stage capitalist hellhole attempting to get as much of your attention as humanly possible because the more of your time and energy that they suck out of you, the more potential for ad revenue. Our world is built to be as distracting as possible. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, our politicians are accepting more and more money from private donors who hide in the shadows, wars are being waged with our tax dollars, and our country is slowly slipping into fascism while most of us can't go 10 minutes without checking social media. This is why distraction is bad for democracy. Roll the intro. Thank you to my partner on today's video, Factor. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals straight to your doorstep that are truly and legitimately, I cannot stress this enough, the best prepared meals I have ever had. The flavor, the pizzazz, the ease of just popping them into the microwave for two minutes with no prep or cleanup. For me, an ADHD girly, I cannot tell you how much of a lifesaver Factor is, especially because summer is coming up and I wanna be outside and not in the kitchen. But I also have health goals that are really hard to achieve when I have nothing to reach for and instead end up just microwaving some chicken nuggies like a toddler. Not with Factor. I know I'm getting a chef prepared meal that includes actual vegetables and it tastes amazing. They have a weekly menu of 35 options, including options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. They also have add ons like breakfasts, snacks, and beverages, so you never have to worry about anything. I recently tried their creamy pesto pork chop meal for the first time and they really drop banger after banger over there at Factor. So what are you waiting for? Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LEGIA50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next box. That's code LEGIA50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Thanks Factor. Nothing lays bare the depth of our distraction quite like our obsession with celebrity and conspicuous wealth. And nothing exemplifies our obsession with celebrity quite like the fervor with which we follow drama within the British royal family. After obsessive royal watchers observed that Kate Middleton had been missing for months, rumors began circulating that any number of things had happened to her. She died, she got a tummy tuck, she got a BBL. From there came the obsessive dissection of every new image the royal family dropped of her. And finally, a video was released of her announcing she had cancer and was undergoing preventive chemotherapy. But even that wasn't enough as people began obsessively combing over the video and speculating that it was AI generated. And listen, I'm all for trying to spot fake news at every turn, but imagine if this many people were this obsessed with dissecting every piece of fake or AI generated news about, you know, politics or anything that actually mattered. And I don't mean to sound like a curmudgeonly boomer about this stuff, though I truly will never understand the obsession with the royal family. Like I do not give a flying fuck, but I am a huge consumer of social media. Chronically on Online is an accurate description of how I spend my time. I was a Tumblr girly from the moment Tumblr became a thing. I was on Facebook as soon as I could get on there. Anyone who follows me on Instagram knows my stories are full of absolutely unhinged memes, which you should absolutely follow me. They're hilarious and exceptionally well curated, okay? And I go through phases where I can spend a couple hours a day on TikTok. I love TikTok. I also have a handful of reality TV shows that I watch, RuPaul's Drag Race and 90 Day Fiance. It's trash. Could I instead be watching the news or reading nonfiction or doggedly dissecting my elected officials every move? Absolutely. I'm also not a robot, so there does need to be some balance that includes me being able to turn off my brain once in a while. Please know I am not coming at this topic from a high horse looking down. I am in the social media trenches with you. And I frankly have a hard time relating to people who don't consume social media content. It's a huge part of the culture for 
for anyone under 50. And I think there's a value in having shared culture, even if that culture is like early YouTube videos like Charlie Bit Me, Salad Fingers, Old Greg, and the Shoes music video. That I can bond with people over that shared cultural nostalgia feels good. But I do think it is important, given the current state of the world, to take a step back and question our collective level of distraction. Today, I wanted to continue this two-part series on our obsession with celebrity by focusing on how our distraction plays into the hands of corporations and politicians around the world. Is it a big conspiracy, or is it just a natural end result of rampant capitalism? And how is our distraction ultimately contributing to our demise? But in talking about this, I think it's important to note that our distraction didn't start with social media. Victorian people were distracted either by their labor or by leisure. They didn't have phones to stare at, but they certainly had media to consume and celebrities to gossip about. As early as the 15 and 1600s, people were interested in the lives of actors and playwrights. By the 18th century, literacy increased and printing books became faster and easier. So public intellectuals like Rousseau and Byron and Voltaire gained notable fame and even had obsessed fans who took to stalking them. French actors actress Sarah Bernhardt is one of the earliest examples of the modern celebrity. Her fame grew in the late 1800s along with the popularity of photographs and the penny press, which acted as early paparazzi, following her every move on and off stage. And steamship and railway travel allowed her to go on world tours that few actors had ever done before. With the advent of the telegraph, news about her could travel faster. Almost everyone in the world had heard of her, read about her, or seen her picture. The advent of motion pictures and TV meant moving advertisements and celebrity endorsements that quickly followed. Celebrities would also act as political sidekicks, showing up to political rallies and boosting interest and support for candidates. And as politics began to take center stage on TV, the switch towards a growing public preference for staged political entertainment and a fusion of celebrity with politics began to escalate, especially beginning with the televised Kennedy-Nixon debates in the 1960s, showing a young, handsome Senator Kennedy next to a sweating, older Nixon, which directly affected public opinion going into the election. By the 70s, People magazine became one of the first celebrity-centric tabloid magazines showing the revenue potential of celebrity journalism and shifting public interest towards the personal lives of the rich and famous. And in 1980, America elected a C-list actor to the presidency, solidifying the intermingling of fame and politics. And this celebrity-to-politician pipeline has grown ever since. Clint Eastwood was elected mayor of a small California town in 1986. Former WWE wrestler and actor Jesse Ventura became governor of Minnesota in 1998. Yes, when I was in grade school, I had to learn about our governor, former pro wrestler Jesse Ventura. Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor of California in 2003. And then Trump saw what these guys were doing and said, hold my fucking beer. And by 2016, we had all become so comfortable with the idea that a celebrity is qualified to hold political office solely on the grounds of being well known that somehow we elected an alleged billionaire with little if any skills in business, politics, and basic phonics to the most powerful office in the land. And the trend continues, with people calling for Oprah to run for president despite no political qualifications. Matthew McConaughey is considering running for office, saying recently in a radio interview, I'm an artist. I'm a storyteller. I'm a folk singer. Are those parts of me that could be useful in a political position of leadership to be the CEO of a state or country? Maybe. No, Matt, they're not. All right, all right, all right. Today, the very idea of celebrity has once again changed, with your average everyday person able to gain considerable fame from the comfort of their own home on social media. Who counts as a celebrity has gotten murkier. Someone can have over a million subscribers on YouTube and you or I have never heard of them, yet they have considerable influence over a large group of people and make a career out of being well known. And some of them run for office too. In 2021, YouTuber Kevin Paffrath ran for governor of California, winning 9.6% of the vote. At the time, he had half a million followers, and now he has nearly two million followers and makes multiple videos every single day, I don't know how he does it, about real estate and finance, and reportedly makes millions of dollars doing so. But most of you have probably never heard of him, and most of the people voting in that California election probably hadn't either. Not to downplay his work, but just to show you can be very well known on YouTube, and still, most people don't know who you are. The vast majority of people I come into contact with have no idea who I am, thank God, but I also get recognized in public sometimes and have, like, fangirl moments with people as though I'm a celebrity. It's bizarre, but also appreciated, it's always really nice, just a bizarre feeling given that I am not a celebrity. Or am I? 
It's a blurry line. All that to say, politics and celebrity have merged and Trump is the ultimate result. We cannot seem to look away when celebrity drama unfolds and we attach far more political skill and qualifications to celebrities than they usually deserve just because of their name recognition. And there's a number of reasons why we do this. For one, and this is just my own hypothesis, I think we see our own celebrity potential in the celebrities we admire. As I've said multiple times, Americans tend to see themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. So looking to celebrities who are either wealthy because they're famous or famous because they're wealthy, some people may see themselves in those shoes and look to them aspirationally. As we discussed in part one, many, many children and adults wish to be celebrities or social media influencers. So there's the aspirational effect. There's also just the influence that celebrities have over us because of our tendency for social comparison. People are obsessed with whatever Hailey Bieber is wearing and want to look like her. People look to influencers like Alex Earl for the latest beauty trends, partially because they make them look so shiny and amazing. The draw of comparing yourself to others can lead to an obsession with following what celebrities are doing in the hopes of replicating it so maybe you too can be as glamorous and beautiful. Additionally, there's the psychological effect of parasocial relationships, where a person watches a celebrity in a movie or in interviews or an influencer on YouTube or Instagram and bonds with them as as though they were actually friends in the real world. And the brain isn't often great at differentiating the two. So onlookers feel like they've had a personal shared experience with a celebrity, when in reality, the celebrity has no idea who they are. And this can often be benign. Like there are YouTubers especially that I have never met, but watch regularly and feel like they're my pals. Or after finishing a long TV series or a great book, I get kind of sad because I never get to see my friends again who I just spent so many hours with. But also I know none of that is real. But this can often lead to dangerous situations where a person who's maybe already experiencing a mental health crisis hyperfixates on a famous person, leading to stalking and threats. Or someone who's young and easily manipulated can fall prey to a celebrity they look up to. Or any number of ways that the creation of a parasocial relationship can lead to real-world interactions that are problematic. And then there's the simple desire for escapism. Especially with the advent of reality TV, voyeurism is easier than ever. And it can sometimes just be purely entertaining to be a fly on the wall of someone else's reality, especially if they live a life more luxurious and glamorous than yours. However, this obsession can be exploited in a way that can lead to very real consequences, both politically and personally. This distraction is exploited at three levels, economic, emotional, and political. First, economically, celebrity worship has been used to sell products since the beginning of the 20th century. Today, influencer marketing is a fast-growing industry because companies trying to sell their products and services know that we have parasocial relationships with influencers in a way that we don't with most celebrities. We see celebrities in film and TV, we listen to their music, we watch or read their interviews, but they're usually never speaking directly to us, unless they're trying to sell us something. That worked for a while, but I think the allure of seeing, like, I don't know, Zendaya, selling a fragrance is less influential than it once was. We know there's a 50-50 chance she's ever even seen or used the product before showing up on set and becoming the face of that product. The illusion isn't there anymore. But for influencers who are regular people who talk directly to their audiences and share their life day in and day out, when they use or endorse a product, there's a lot more trust. Their followers genuinely believe they use the product. And more times than not, that is the case, at least on camera. They are selling the product or service by showing how they personally use it. The level of connection and trust is much deeper and companies know that. So they invest in influencer marketing because that's where your attention is. And as someone who creates content, I have earned your attention. And a company pays me to direct your attention to a product or service for 60 seconds during my videos. Obviously I make sure the product or service is legit and that I genuinely can recommend it to you. And I genuinely enjoy the products and services that I mentioned, but ultimately I am selling your attention. Where it gets economically exploitative, however, is when that attention is being manipulated in deceptive ways ways for a profit. And that can happen with social media influencers, but also with traditional news media as well. The essential role of journalism in a perfect world is to inform the masses and dig deep into what's happening in our politics and society to expose corruption. When it's working well, that's what happens. The problem is that as our media companies have conglomerated over the last couple decades, we are left with six media companies that control 90% of US media. For comparison, in 1990, that same 90% of US media was distributed across 50 companies. How did this happen? Say it with me, Ronald fucking Reagan. He systematically did away with regulations governing ownership rules meant to protect against monopolies. And this deregulation allowed massive companies to buy up all the independent news outlets to where now news media and entertainment media 
are one and the same, owned by the same people with the same goals of just getting eyeballs and ad revenue. When monopolies like this start to form, the benevolent goals of news media to adhere to journalistic standards and inform the masses are compromised in the name of money. The goal is always to increase profits, not empower the masses. This means that the information system that we're immersed in is structured based on algorithms that reinforce our biases and ultimately are meant to keep our attention for as long as possible in order to market things to us as much as possible. More eyeballs means more ad revenue. Unfortunately, we are most enthused by gossip, clickbait, and hyperbole. I made a whole video on why we're so attracted to bad news, you can go watch it after this. And that means that in order to keep our attention, these media giants have have to focus on making the content that gets the most eyeballs, to the detriment of the coverage of important but less sexy political news at the local and federal level. Our eyes aren't drawn to that news. It's not what makes them money, unless there's a scandal or they play it up to be a scandal. Enter Fox News, which is able to take any piece of news and make its viewers think it's the end of the world. Great for attention and ad revenue, not great for society, and very distracting from the things that actually tangibly affect our day-to-day -day lives, like local board elections or the backroom deals our Congress people are agreeing to. And so our easy distraction is exploited on an economic level and six major media companies get to profit while we're distracted. So our distraction is exploited economically, but there is also emotional exploitation and political exploitation. Our collective distraction exploits us emotionally in a number of ways. Studies have found that high levels of celebrity worship, that is intense and compulsive feelings towards a favorite celebrity, recurring obsessive thoughts about a celebrity, and extreme forms of admiration, like if your favorite celebrity asks you to do something illegal, you would do it, no questions asked. Those levels of celebrity worship are associated with neuroticism, symptoms of depression and anxiety, poor relationships with others, concerns about body image, narcissism, psychoticism, and tendencies towards criminal behaviors and addiction. There is also a correlation between celebrity worship and problematic internet use, meaning an inability to control your own use of the internet to the point that it's causing psychological distress and impairment of everyday functioning. This can lead to impulsive spending or doom scrolling for hours while social media companies collect ad revenue from our inability to look away. And while we're distracted, our mental health is going downhill and major companies continue to profit. Profit. But mainly, and most importantly for the point I'm trying to make in this video, our distractibility is exploited politically. There's a whole academic term for this, the politics of distraction, and people have been talking about it for decades, as it's only gotten worse. In fact, one of the most helpful sources I found for this video is an academic paper from 2005. In it, the author says, the politics of distraction work essentially by shifting the public's attention from the essential to the superficial. As this happens, politics become less about governing and more about entertainment. The line has gotten more blurry as celebrities have become politicians, from Reagan all the way to Trump, and citizens move from being voters to being fans. Politicians who aren't celebrities still seek celebrity status and are subject to Hollywood-style tabloid coverage. They're turned into icons. You can buy AOC and Ruth Bader Ginsburg saint candles. And don't get me started on the Trump worship merch. And this article from 2005 indicates that this has been going on at least since then, with George W. Bush painted as the happy hick, whose verbal gaffes were just part of the charm and his stupidity rendered him harmless, while in the background his advisors like Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld could make decisions behind the scenes with little public scrutiny so long as the sideshow of the happy hick continued. According to this article, that was especially true with the onset of the Iraq War, saying the notion that Iraq constituted an imminent threat to the United States because of imagined weapons of mass destruction was absurd to anyone outside the spell manufactured by Hollywood scriptwriters and foisted systematically on a bewildered public, which was led to believe that it had a right for revenge in some movie-like showdown. And most presciently, the author goes on to posit, the underlying problem is that collectively, after so many years of celebrities entering politics, politics and politicians play-acting constructed celebrity roles, Americans have lost the capacity to judge what constitutes truth. Again, he wrote this in 2005. And then Trump came along as kind of the ultimate boss, the predictable conclusion of this fusion of politics and celebrity. And after decades of being primed to see politics as entertainment, to judge what's true based not on facts, but on what's most believable, people in the US were ready and willing to elect Trump to office and primed for the sweep of disinformation that he brought with him. And one reason for why Trump's win in 2016 was able to take many of us by surprise was because I think we underestimate how widespread, pervasive, and 
inconsequential our collective distraction is, and how that has a very real effect on politics. As we've already established, people generally are increasingly distracted by celebrity, by gossip, and by entertainment, for a variety of reasons. Human nature, media conglomerates increasingly exploiting that human nature for ad revenue, and the increasing infiltration of celebrity and entertainment in our news media and politics. A recent study in 2023 was able to draw a direct correlation between that distraction and a decrease in political engagement. The study looked at the social media use of a wide swath of participants, as well as a survey that the participants answered, to divide them into subcategories. The inactive, who don't engage much with social media at all. The news avoiders, who engage exclusively or almost exclusively with entertainment content on social media, so celebrity gossip, but also memes and videos of cute dogs, anything that's not political. Then there were the focused, who engage almost exclusively with political content on social media. And finally, there were the distracted, who engage with lots of political and lots of entertainment entertainment content on social media. I would probably personally identify with that last group. My For You page is pretty evenly divided between stupid videos of dogs, a splash of celebrity gossip, personal stories, and other entertainment content, and discussions about political news and political commentary. I love it all. And the study from 2023 found that the more entertainment-oriented content you consume on social media, the less you engage in political participation. So those in the focused group who mainly consumed political content were more politically active than those in the news avoid group who purposely consumed no news or politics content. But most interestingly, they found that those in the distracted group, like me, who consume equal-ish levels of entertainment and news content were less politically engaged the more entertainment content they consumed. And even more tellingly, the more entertainment-oriented content that a person consumes, the less likely they are to engage in high-effort political activities. So those are things like canvassing, creating political content, attending a protest, or participating in mutual aid, for example. For those with exposure to both entertainment and political content, they still participated in low-level forms of political engagement, like signing an online petition or sharing a piece of political content on social media. These findings suggest that as exposure to entertainment content goes up, social media users become distracted to the point of political disengagement. The study posits that entertainment-oriented social media use may distract individuals from political content because non-political content may be more eye-catching as compared to political content. It may be particularly related to close ties, such as friends and family, and or it may be associated with immediate positive gratifications. Also, when permanently confronted with non-political content, political content becomes less likely to be at the top of the head, and therefore may be less accessible. When such situations accumulate over time, non-political content may be chronically accessible, and given limited capacities in information processing, this may compete with or even impede the accessibility of political content. So even if you consume political content, content and genuinely care and are interested in it, the entertainment content you consume may take up more space in your brain. And the more non-political content you consume, the more it builds up in your brain to crowd out the political information. The study goes on to say that when permanently confronted with entertaining non-political content, the current political issues may appear less severe and therefore also less personally relevant. As a consequence, people will engage less with political content. Also, entertainment research suggests that hedonic entertainment content has a high absorption potential. That is, hedonic entertainment content interferes with the cognitive elaboration of other content because it absorbs attentional resources to a degree that interferes with further elaboration. So basically, when you consume celebrity gossip, it literally cognitively impairs your ability to absorb political content, and also affects your perception of the importance of political issues. Your brain grabs onto the easy, hedonistic, shiny things and forgets that you give a shit about abortion access or whatever. And this has a direct consequence on your political participation above liking someone's political tweet or signing a random petition and then forgetting about it. And when this is happening on a massive scale, especially among young people who are already less politically engaged than older people, but also have the most to lose as the world goes down the toilet, it means that entire movements fail to take shape because we're too busy looking at what Kim Kardashian is wearing or hyper fixating on what happened to Kate Middleton. Again, I feel like a boomer saying this. I'm truly right there with you. I love my social media enrichment time in my enclosure, and I do genuinely learn things when I engage with political content on social media. It makes me feel connected with the world. And TikTok has helped spread information about the genocide in Gaza. It's helped people to organize boycotts of 
Kellogg's and other major food companies to protest price gouging. It's actively, as I film this, helping women in New York City connect with each other to identify a pattern of similar attacks perpetrated by the same man in a way that the NYPD could never. It's an incredibly useful tool for political participation. It's also an incredibly useful tool for turning your brain off and getting completely distracted from what's happening around you. And now we have studies showing that that has direct consequences on political outcomes. Okay, so we've identified the growth of celebrity obsession through the ages. We've seen how celebrity has merged with politics to create the monster that is Donald Trump. And we've seen that this obsession with celebrity, whether it's the celebrity of our politicians or the celebrities trying to sell us shit, means that we're incredibly susceptible to exploitation. That can be in the form of economic and emotional exploitation, but it also takes the form of political exploitation. By becoming distracted by celebrity gossip, by being complacent with the celebrification of our politicians, by being glued to entertainment content on our tiny little screens, we are missing the actors who are actually making shit happen behind the scenes and out of the limelight. And we are missing the opportunity to build a movement and engage politically in a way that actually moves the needle. So what the fuck do we do about this? Clearly there are systemic things that need to change. We need to get money out of politics. First and foremost, the money influencing our politicians is what has allowed for media to conglomerate and it's what allows for shady shit to happen behind the scenes that harms the rest of us. But as I've discussed before, the only way to get money out of politics at this point is through a constitutional amendment. And the only way to pass a constitutional amendment is to organize and build a massive movement. It's a Herculean effort, but one that has been successful for the 27 amendments before. And the only way to build that massive movement is through the momentum that comes from organizing and from engaging in high effort political activities. The same high effort political activities that we are less likely to engage in the more we consume content meant to entertain us with no political value. Do you see how we're in a bit of a trap? And so I don't know what it will take, but there needs to be a bit of a collective awakening to this phenomenon. I think each of us should be a bit more mindful of the content we're consuming. I'm not saying you're never allowed to watch videos of cute puppies again or care about your favorite celebrity. We're not robots or martyrs. I'm actually currently reading a book called King. It's the new biography of Martin Luther King Jr. It goes really in depth on the organizing that happened during the civil rights movement and the toll that being seen as the leader of the movement took on King, who was in the end, just an perfect human with great oratory skills who was thrust into the limelight and made into the personification of an entire movement. Anyway, it's a great book. My point is that part of caring for your mental health includes being able to step away from politics and have some goddamn fun. So I'm not saying we have to do away with that. I'm just saying, I don't know, boundaries. We love healthy boundaries here. Understand that the more you tell the algorithm to give you entertaining content, the less it will give you political content. And that will affect your mental health and the health of this democracy. So next time you're interacting with social media, be mindful of what you're telling the algorithm. Interact more with content discussing causes you're passionate about. Enjoy the fun dog videos, but maybe don't like and share them. Follow people who share content about the causes you care about. And if you want to see less entertainment content, on TikTok you can click on the share arrow and at the bottom of the screen, select not interested. On Instagram and Facebook, you can click the three dots above the post and select hide or not interested. This will tell the algorithm the content you don't want to see. And doing that simultaneously with liking and following accounts with content you do want to see will gradually redistribute the content you're seeing naturally on social media to be a bit more skewed politically. According to the research, this subtle shift alone can make a difference in your political engagement. Imagine if all 170 million US-based TikTok users started seeing just a little bit more political content and a little less content about the latest Kate Middleton deepfake scandal. It might not change the world, but it could move us in the right direction. In addition to this, or instead of relying on social media companies to help us save democracy, you could also just be more proactive about taking steps to be more engaged in high effort political participation. A great place to start would be to go to movetoamend.org, not sponsored, and click get involved to find out ways to actively push for a constitutional amendment to get money out of our politics. Whatever you choose to do, I hope the information in this video has at least made you a bit more aware of the forces working to keep you as distracted as possible and how that impacts you economically, emotionally, and politically. Thank you to my Patreon community and my YouTube members for supporting the research and work that goes into these videos. Consider checking out my Patreon community or clicking the big join button below to become a member here on YouTube. You'll be supporting my work and getting access to special extra content. You can also get early access to next week's video, exclusive live streams, exclusive access to my brand new book club, 
Club, and so much more. The extra content is the same whether you join as a YouTube member or on Patreon. Your support helps to keep these videos free for everyone and further our mission towards legal and political education for all. Shout out to my newest supporters as well as supporters in my royal tiers and a very special shout out to my multi-platinum supporters, Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, and Brett Piantic. Your generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. If you like this video, you'll also like my last video all about child actors and the laws that never really protected them. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.